since 1995, when Russia and Iran signed this contract to comp for the completion of the Boucher reactor. Of course, uh, Iran continued its efforts to develop indigenously by itself nuclear uh, technology and by means of these scientists who were in Iran already and also uh, uh, who raise uh, who themselves in, in Russian institutions. Of course, Iran now has become a very uh, capable country in, with respect to nuclear science and technology. Of course, it is not only the uh, Russian Federation which helped raising a significant number of Iranian scientists and scholars or technicians. In the 60s and 70s, France and Germany also opened their institutions to Iranian scholars. Well, there was another Iran, the Shah, the Iran of the Shah, an, an, an ally of the West, or at least a country which had no significant uh, problems with the, with the West. So not only, of course, France and Germany, but also other countries like Canada and some Nordic countries I mean, in Sweden, in Belgium, in, in Italy, in other uh, uh, countries in Europe and North America, United States as well as Canada. So uh, they all have opened their institutions to Iranian students for earning their degrees in master's degrees and PhD degrees and also work in these com uh, companies, in, in, in companies in these countries. So Iran today is a, is a country which is capable of uh, um, developing almost a complete nuclear fuel cycle. What do we mean by a nuclear fuel cycle? Actually it is a cycle which starts with the extraction of uranium uh, the natural uranium, which is under the beneath of the uh, surface and under the ground, and it has it has to be extracted, then of course uh, cleaned up, purified, and it has to be converted into uranium uh, hexafluoride. It's a gas which is used for enrichment, and then of course you make fuel, then you use in the uh, nuclear re reactors core, then the waste uh, 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 incorporates a certain amount of uh, plutonium and then if you are capable of extracting that plutonium uh, then by, by way of reprocess reprocessing then you have or you can use either in the um, plutonium fueled reactors or for other purposes such as weapons development. At this point uh, for making things a uh, little bit more uh, clear, I have to explain s certain things with numbers and figures uh, in its simplest form possible. So it may not be very, very sort of uh, easy to understand for some of you, but it's just uh, even simpler than simplest uh, chemistry that you may have learned at your high schools. Well, uranium in nature is found basically in two isotopes. And so the percentages that exist in nature are as such 0.07% and um, uranium 235, which is a very, in, in an uh, unstable condition and with the heat of a neutron uranium-235 splits and generates electricity, uh, energy. So let's uh, try to understand what it means. A neutron if sent to a 235 it splits so and then this significant amount of energy is released and then this hits another 235, another. So there is this chain reaction which actually is needed for a nuclear weapons to detonate, to be detonated. What is important therefore is to have this 235 isotope. 
238 cannot be directly used in weapons. It can be used for other purposes, such as clouding of armory. I mean, you may have uh, heard uran depleted uranium used for, uh, in some uh, uh, weapon systems, which, according to some reports, were used during the uh, war in the Balkans. There were some accusations. I will not go into de that detail. But what is significant is this. But since this percentage exists in nature, it cannot be used for weapons purposes. For a nuclear weapon, you need at least, I mean, if this is the uh, uh, sort of uh, amount that you need to produce a weapon, the percentage of 235 must be, U-235 must be 90 plus percent. It is found only this much in nature. So there is actually uh, a, only one way to increase this, which is known as enrichment. Enrichment is something that is uh, carried out in specific uh, facilities, enrichment facilities, of course, by way of uh, Centrifuges, there are also some other technologies, but the technology that Iran is known to have today is uranium uh, centrifuges uh, for enrichment. And uh, in this uh, facility that we'll be talking about a li little bit later, uh, that was uh, hidden for so many years, uh, from 1984 to 2002, for about 18 years beyond the reach or beyond the control of the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, Iran establish a large enrichment facility. So what is important to know here, this 235 isotope, if enriched up to 3.5 or uh, within the range of 3.5 to 8 percent, it can be used in nuclear reactors. In the nuclear reactor core, if you use a fuel, uranium fuel, incorporating only 3.5 to 8 percent, and the average is 4, 4.5, 5 percent, depending on uh, the uh, sort of type of fuel technology used in the reactor. So th this percentage is needed for uh, uh, civilian uses, for electricity generation. But for weapons purposes, as I said, 90 percent is needed. Therefore, the natural percentage must be increased for civil uses up to 3.5 percent or up to 90 percent or plus or above for weapons purposes. And you can achieve this through certain technologies, one of which is centrifuge technology, which is widely used in many countries for fuel fabrication. Most enrichment facilities in the world, uh, actually there are some uh, 12 or 13 countries which have this capability today, and most of the production is for fuel production. In the nuclear reactor's core, you, you, you have 3.5% enriched uranium, which is said to be low enriched uranium. And in the core, you uh, sort of uh, irradiate this fuel by a neutron. Then you start a certain process. And of course, for this, uh, and this process gener uh, generates heat here in the core of the reactor, which uh, or by means of which this heat, you boil the water, and the water pr uh, produces vapor. Vapor is forced into the turbines, which once they turn, uh, they, they generate electricity. I mean, had this been coal or gas or oil, motor oil, motor oil whatever, you could still boil the water. And so you need something uh, to boil the water for vapor generation, which in turn uh, uh, to turn the turbines and to generate electricity. So if you use nuclear fuel, then uh, you have nuclear reactor. You use nuclear fuel, then you have nuclear energy. So therefore, this is, uh, in that sense, is important. Um, something uh, maybe I should sh uh, try to uh, show a little bit more explicitly about how this works. Again, in its simplest possible for. Again, assume this is the fuel in the core. Of course, it's not, the shape is different than that. There are different shapes. 
rods or plates or discs, whatever, and assume these are, of course, 235s. Well, of course, they are not static. They are moving at all times, right? And then you send a neutron, and if a neutron hits here, a 235 splits, as I said, generates heat, and then releases another neutron, which in turn heats another uh, 235, then uh, the process is you know, continuing as such. But some of the neutrons, which the rest, the white, is 238. And these are 235, right? Well, this is the simplest form that I can sort of show you. So the ones that uh, do not hit anything go astray, or at some point these white 235s that you can see here, if we had another color maybe, anyway, some of them turn into 239 with the capture of a neutron. So this 239 actually is what we call plutonium, which during this nuclear reactor's core operation, these 235s are consumed by the heat of a neutron by releasing energy and releasing another neutron which hits another 235, releases another you know, amount of energy, etc. And these are consumed, this uh, amounting to up to 3.5% or 5%, whatever, or maybe 8%. Some reactors now work with 8% low energy uranium. And once these are consumed, this fuel is of no more any use. So you, you have to treat as a waste. So the waste treatment in nuclear technology is one of the most problematic issues. There are basically, of course, toxicity and radiation, radi radioactivity of the waste, which is of great concern to countries for the environment, and also the amount of plutonium that is there for, for a certain period. So since this core, the fuel, which is consumed for about six months, a year, depending on the length of the operation of the nuclear reactor, then you take this fuel and you immerse in uh, deep water. This fuel is, uh, you may have seen on TV channels when uh, some Iranian sort of uh, uh, politicians looking into something like a pool, which actually is where the uh, uh, fuel rods are immersed for cooling. So it has to stay there for about a year or so, a year and a half, depends. Uh, it, it has to cool down to tolerable levels or workable levels, and after which these, uh, this waste fuel can be subject to, I mean, you either just store there somewhere, I mean, which has uh, to have no uh, contact with uh, water or the environment. It has to be kept very safe and secure. Uh, we should not reach, uh, pass into the hands of uh, some other people, uh, some unauthorized people, but also you have to take the necessary uh, environmental sort of precautions. But, I mean, either you can treat as a waste and uh, take this fuel, spent fuel, and uh, sort of uh, bury somewhere safe, how safe this is also debated, or if we have any uh, military uh, purposes, you may take this fuel, the waste fuel, and uh, the 238 plus a neutron, which is plutonium, then by using some chemical reprocessing uh, methods, then you can extract that plutonium. I don't know if you have seen it yesterday or the day before, there was a big uh, demonstration in Germany, which they tried to blockade a train coming from France, which was carrying the reprocessed waste fuel, which was uh, used by German nuclear reactors, sent to France for reprocessing or for uh, some purposes and uh, probably plutonium might have been extracted and uh, the, the reprocessed fuel was being sent back to Germany and there was big clashes between the security forces and the demonstrators and the, uh, the, the environmentalists or the Greenpeace or other people. Uh, so therefore this issue has always been a problematic issue. But what is important to bear in mind is that enrichment is such a technology that you need for fuel production, for nuclear reactors, 
if you enrich up to 3.5 or 4 percent, 5 percent, or 8 percent, above 8 percent, it would be risky. So uh, uh, typical uh, civilian nuclear reactors do not use fuel uh, uh, with percentages higher than 8 percent. Normally, it's 3.5 or 4.5 percent. So you need enrichment for this purpose. If you don't have a conduit-type reactor, uh, Canadian deuterium uranium re reactor, which uses natural uranium, which does not need uh, uh, enrichment. Only the Kandu or Canadian reactors do not use uh, enriched uranium. They use natural uranium, of course, after some purification, they have to be made into fuel pellets and then used in the reactor core. And of course, for this uh, neutron to hit very low concentration of 235, you need some moderators, uh, such as heavy water, which is a thick uh, liquid, which slows down the neutron and increases the likelihood for neutron to hit at 235, which is much less in concentration. So in 235% low energy uranium, in most typical uh, 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 civil nuclear reactors, you need 3.5 and uh, percent, and therefore you can generate electricity for an extended period. So the fuel, as I said, once used, it has to be treated as a waste and uh, buried somewhere or kept in very safe storage places, or it can be reprocessed to get the, uh, the plutonium, which is there for for a certain period, which is not there for all the time. So uh, therefore. This is uh, this is something that uh, this is something that uh, is significant. What we have to understand from here is that the reprocessing, for instance, today Japan has, uh, as far as I know, 53 or 54 nuclear reactors. And if I'm not mistaken, all of these nuclear reactors use uh, plutonium as fuel. So plutonium can also be used as a fuel, and again, uh, these figures vary. It is not always possible to have the exact number, but uh, Japan is said to have several thousand tons of plutonium stocks that can be more than sufficient for more than maybe 100 or even more so years for 50 plus nuclear reactors that they have. So plutonium can be used also for civilian nuclear reactors as a fuel. But of course, there is always a danger because plutonium, if not used in the nuclear reactor as a fuel, which requires a spe special, uh, they are called fast breeder reactors, which also produce more plutonium than they consume. Well, that's a different uh, dimension of the problem. But this plutonium, if not used for civilian purposes, can be readily used in weapons. So even though most Japanese colleagues of mine and Japanese politicians would not like to uh, admit it, but uh, in the West there is always this question, maybe not as significant as other questions with respect to other countries, but uh, what would Japan do with this large stocks of plutonium, which Japan claims to be accumulating for uh, further uh, and uh, civilian uses in the coming years. But of course the large amount of plutonium stocks uh, has always been a, a source of worry in some circles in the West, which I also myself witnessed during some of the discussions between Japanese and American especially authorities. Anyway, so what we have to bear in mind is that this especially enrichment technology as well as uh, reprocessing technology, are two significant technologies that, can, that are necessary to some extent for civilian purposes, but also can be used for military purposes, especially if enrichment levels are increased from the civilian uses level, which is normally 3.5. In some research reactors, such as the one in Chekmeje here, in, in Istanbul and also in Tehran, 20% enrichment might be necessary. There are also some other civilian uses, for instance, uh, nuclear submarines. Of 
course, most nuclear submarines are nuclear weapon uh, carriers, but not all of them are nuclear weapon carriers because nuclear, <coughs> nuclear submarines are such submarines which operate with a nuclear reactor because uh, thanks to the nuclear reactor, uh, nuclear submarines can, of course, do not need large stocks of uh, like gasoline, uh, whatever, to, to be carried all the way for long distances. And, and, and with a small re re reactor in the submarine, uh, nuclear fuel can generate large amount of uh, energy for extended periods, electricity, and, and, and to turn the uh, propellers, and so, so therefore to operate the submarine, but also to clean the air and also to, to desalinate the water. So thanks to this uh, nuclear technology in the nuclear submarines, uh, nuclear submarines can stay uh, under the water without coming to surface for very long periods. And as I said, not all of them are military submarines, I mean, uh, or nuclear weapons carriers. So therefore, uh, nuclear submarines use 60% enriched or even 80% enriched uranium. So therefore, there can be some non-military applications of enrichment starting from 3.5 for civilian nuclear reactors or 20% for research reactors or 60 or 80% or even higher percentages for um, uh, submarine uses. So enrichment is a very, very significant technology. And, and depend, depending on your end use or depending on your ultimate purpose, enrichment technology may pose a threat or may have meter significance or may not pose any threat depending on uh, the uh, uh, intentions and uh, the desires of the country. So therefore, at the core of all this debate, I mean, the starting point of our discussion here was uh, today's Iran, uh, I Iran's problematic uh, sort of situation with respect to its relations uh, with the Western countries, especially the United States. So there is this puzzle. On the one hand, there is an Iran which has launched a nuclear program as early as the U.S. president suggested to the world that nuclear technology is good and everyone should benefit from it provided that, of course, they don't exploit the situation for major purposes. And then the United States uh, uh, gave encouragement to a number of countries, including Turkey and Iran, for installing small research reactors, then large power reactors, and then also educated these uh, people, uh, or people from these countries, including Iran. And in the 70s, especially after Iran acquired large amounts of money from oil exports when uh, raised the bar and increased its ambitions to develop uh, 20,000 megawatt electric uh, installed nuclear capability within the following 20 years. Then the United States or American, uh, German, French firms rushed into Iran to sell their technologies and uh, including enrichment and reprocessing, which are now problems, pro have uh, become problematic. So Iran says, Look, I am a state party to the MPT and the, the, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. And I sort of do my homework. I comply with the treaty obligations. And therefore, I have the right to benefit from uh, uh, my, uh, my rights, such as develop uh, nuclear uh, peaceful uh, technology. So let's have a look at the situation before going on any further with respect to the MPT. I don't think we have discussed this issue here. And without discussing the MPT and some of its major provisions, it is not possible to understand fully what exactly is the situation with respect to Iran's uh, nuclear program. Well, what does being a state party to the MPT mean? MPT, as I said, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, which was signed in 1980, 1968 and entered into force in 1970. And since then, in, I mentioned this a little bit, in five-year uh, intervals, it, there is this review conferences. And in 1995, the MPT was extended uh, indefinitely 
and unconditionally. Well, I said this at the outset because MPT is here to, say, to stay with us for as long as we can think of. Of course, um, provided all the countries you know, uh, go ahead with the regime or comply with the provisions of the regime or unless something extraordinary happens and which leads to the collapse of the regime. So, MPT, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, is at the core of all this debate today. And we have to properly understand what it means. As I said, uh, in uh, 45, United States, in 49, the Soviet Union, in 1952, the United Kingdom, in 1960, France, and in 1964, China. People's Republic of China have detonated their nuclear devices. Well, especially after uh, French detonation, when uh, you know, some concerns started to be raised as to how many countries would acquire nuclear weapons technology in uh, how long in, into the future, there is this uh, information about um, uh, the Kennedy administration, uh, which, I mean, Kennedy himself is known for having asked from his uh, defense secretary, uh, McNamara, to conduct a study and to have an assessment as to how far this could go. I mean, I mean what would be the scope of this uh, development in nuclear technology, and in 1962, 63, the McNamara study suggests that within the f next 20 years, I mean by the early 1980s, if everything goes the way they uh, sort of uh, go at the moment, um, there will be approximately 35 to 40 states which would acquire nuclear weapons. So if nothing is done to stop the spread of nuclear technology, McNamara uh, believes, of course, based on his uh, uh, team's uh, research on the subject, that there are at least some 30, 35 other states which are scientifically, technologically capable and also politically willing to develop nuclear technology. And if nothing ha uh, is, is done to prevent this from happening within the next 20 years, in, in the early 1980s, it is possible to see some 35 to 40 states with nuclear weapons, which, of course, was not a desirable situation. So, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, which brought the two superpowers uh, to the brink of nuclear exchange, I mean, uh, nuclear warfare, and the world was saved from a nuclear uh, warfare, nuclear catastrophe, and it is so believed that the two leaders, as well as uh, two countries, I mean, the United States and the Soviet Union, have learned their lessons from this uh, showdown, uh, uh, the brinkmanship in the, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and they intensified and also accelerated their efforts to uh, take such measures that would prevent further proliferation, further spread of nuclear technology into the hands of many states and also uh, to prevent other states from developing this technology. Because, I mean, at that time in the 1960s, many European countries, Sweden, Belgium, Germany, others, were capable, maybe if not at that time, but would, were capable of developing such weapons sooner than later. And, and, and so maybe by the early 1970s, if there would be no such an agreement, no treaty, uh, such as the MPT, and, uh, other European states, Western European countries, of course, provided that there was this political will to do so, they could have very well developed nuclear weapons. So in order to prevent this, the Soviet Union and the uh, United States, as I said, accelerated their efforts and also intensified their efforts. They tried to resolve some of their differences because one was the leader of the Western Bloc and the other was the leader of the Eastern Bloc. So they had a lot of influence on other countries. And uh, at times when they were disagreeing on other political issues, 
of course, their decisions would be very political rather than maybe rational, but especially after having seen China uh, detonating uh, its uh, first nuclear device, then the USSR and the United States have combined their efforts and paid away to uh, a, a conclusion of diplomatic efforts which aim at uh, developing or drafting a, an international treaty. So in 1968, the MPT was open to signature after so many, of course, deliberations. It's not an easy issue. And I, in my doctoral dissertation, I had studied uh, this process. Uh, for those interested, I can send a copy of my dissertation, which I haven't read since I finished it, because you read so many times, and then you're fed up, and you do not want to see it again. Anyway, so in 1968, this treaty was signed, open to uh, signature, and by the year 1970, after the 40th ratification, which was necessary for the entry into force, uh, the, the, the treaty entered into force. Well, this treaty is significant in the sense that it distinguishes or discriminates, the term here might be a little bit tricky, between two groups of states. Anybody who knows uh, the meaning of this NWS and double NWS? Well, my former students will remember, of course, from other courses. Well, there is two, basically two groups of states, nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. What does this mean? According to the MPT, because it was signed in 1968 and entered into force 1970, by the time United States, USSR, the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, France, and China have all developed and tested their first nuclear devices, since it is not possible to give up that technology for good, I mean, once and for all, for political reasons, technological reasons, economic reasons, et cetera, et cetera, and military reasons, of course. They said, look, now that we have this technology, it doesn't mean that we, will, we want to keep it forever. And we will do our best to start negotiations uh, at the earliest time possible for fully disarming ourselves. But in the meantime, we don't want any new nuclear power uh, or nuclear weapons capable state. So if you sign the MPT and agree to be a non-nuclear weapon state, that is, commit yourself and promise that you will never, ever even intend to develop nuclear weapons in the future, we will give you uh, uh, all the assistance that might be necessary for you to develop uh, peaceful uh, nuclear uh, technology for peaceful exploitation, like energy generation applications in agriculture and health sector. So many states at the time, like 60, 70, 80 of them at the beginning, they said, well, um, if we sign up with the MPT, I mean, if you become a state party to the MPT, as a non-nuclear weapon state, and if you forego the option, I mean, if we just quit or give up the option of weapons uh, uh, application, we will get nuclear technology, and we will get nuclear science assistance uh, in this field, and, well, we will be better off by signing this and becoming a member of the MPT, and therefore we go ahead and sign because some state decided that they would never have any major ambitions anyway, so why the bother to develop uh, nuclear technology for peaceful purposes? And by giving up this major option, they would get assistance that they could possibly not get, not be able to get otherwise. So by, by agreeing to be a non-nuclear weapon state, and by, by agreeing to give up the major option once and for all, they believed they could get ample assistance from the West or from the developed countries in terms of uh, nuclear technology uh, usage uh, exploitation in their country. So the five states which had detonated a nuclear device or nuclear weapon for prior to 1st of January 1967 were counted as nuclear weapon state and they were allowed to keep their nuclear weapons, of course, with the condition of starting at an early date 
uh, uh, negotiations for complete disarmament, which since then, under the Cold War conditions, was not possible uh, to uh, achieve such a, uh, such a result. Anyway, but on the other hand, all other states were invited to join the MPT as a non-nuclear weapon state by giving up the option of becoming a, or exploiting nuclear energy for military purposes, but instead uh, get this uh, technology for peaceful applications. So therefore, in a sense, the bargain was simple. You give up the military option, you get technology for peaceful applications. So th this issue is important. I mean, this is also known as the bargain between uh, nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. It's known as bargain. So, of course, uh, it is not possible to count on states' declarations only. When a state promises to do something, how can you make sure that that state do really uh, complies with what it, you know, it is obliged to do and uh, live, lives up to, it, to the commitments? So the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was established already in 1957, with a view to uh, you know, moderating or regulating the nuclear exchanges between haves and have-nots, I mean states that have nuclear technology and that do not have nuclear technology. And the IAEA was given the task of conducting inspections in the countries, uh, in the non-nuclear weapon states, in order to see if these states which may have acquired nuclear uh, technology by way of transfer or by way of developing themselves and to see if they were, there was any diversion from peaceful uses to military uses. So because non-nuclear weapon states promise that they will never ever develop nuclear weapons. And this is a commitment which was made once and for all at, by signing and ratifying the MPT. Ratification is something that ties the hand of next generations. So long as treaty is in force, even if regime changes in a country, unless that country withdraws from the treaty, the treaty binds the hands of the next administration or next regime. So just as the case in Iran today, the Shah regime, which signed and ratified the MPT, uh, and this situation also ties the hand of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So therefore, the, uh, many countries, by signing uh, the MPT and ratifying it, also accepted the inspections of the IAEA in these countries and to prove to the world that they are not doing anything wrong other than that they were allowed to do, which was the only and only peaceful applications, and that there was no diversion from peaceful to military purposes. But of course, there, has, there was a difficulty since the 1970s when the treaty entered into force and the IAEA inspections, IAEA inspections were attempted to be carried out in the non-nuclear weapon states. Because the, 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 the protocol or the procedures that govern the inspections uh, had some loopholes and shortcomings. In the 1970s, what was known as the model protocol, uh, it, it incorporated a number of loopholes which some countries benefited, such as Iraq. Remember here, we mentioned the IAEA conducting inspections with a view to destroying, removing, and rendering harmless the nuclear infrastructure of Iraq, according to the UN Resolution 687. So Iraq, as a state party to the MPT, a country which had signed and ratified the MPT, and which was supposed to not to develop nuclear weapons, was under the sort of a, a peaceful uh, uh, operations of some of the facilities, but there were some also attempts as well in diverting some of the uh, 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 technology and material from peaceful to military purposes. And the IAEA, although it was conducting inspections from time to time if before the 1991 war, could not find anything or could not prove anything, even though there was um, there were some uh, intelligence reports that Iraq was doing something illegal under the MPT. But because the IAEA's mandate was limited, 
according to the model protocol, which had some loopholes. The model protocol prevented the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors to visit every facility that they deemed would be important and also uh, every place in the facility. So there were some difficulties in that. And therefore, uh, the, the inspection procedures was, uh, were, were not so um, convincing. This, this situation was open to exploitation, was open to uh, manipulation, as well as uh, uh, some countries uh, use this for other purposes. So this is therefore something at the crux of the matter. But in short, what we have to remember from the MPT, I mean, there are many things that you have to know about it, but of, with respect to the specific purpose of Iran's question, is that Iran is a country which has signed and ratified uh, the, uh, the treaty and assumed the obligation to benefit from nuclear technology that it may have transferred from other countries such as Russia or it may have developed indigenously in its own with its own capabilities but use them only f and only for peaceful purposes and that Iran could not uh, uh, sort of for any reason have any major ambitions. Of course uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, the rights side of the situation. The obligations, as I said, is to not to do anything wrong uh, that may have major applications. But the, 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 the line between uh, this sort of uh, uh, peaceful and major applications is so thin because with exactly the same or similar nuclear infrastructure and scientific accumulation, a country may or may not uh, use for both purposes or deviate from peaceful to military within not in uh, so you know, a long a time period and if at all possible under some covered projects may uh, sort of adopt some uh, or may develop some military capabilities. So Iran is a country which is subject to IEA inspections and uh, entertains its rights, uh, its rights from uh, the MPT I mean, uh, by way of technology transfers and developing by itself indigenously and opens its uh, uh, facilities to inspections. But according to the older protocol, uh, the 1971 IAEA model protocol, which, as I said, has some loopholes and shortcomings. And under this protocol, it is not possible for the IAEA to provide assurances to the world that there is nothing wrong that Iran is doing. Of course, even today, uh, just uh, on, on TV uh, news, I, I saw that the IEA made a statement. Uh, Amano, the, the current uh, director general of the IEA, stated that he is not in a position to provide assurances that Iran is not doing anything wrong. Just like the situation with Anmovic. Remember, uh, Anmovic was not able to find anything because there was not uh, in anything to find, maybe, or things that they were supposed to find were either uh, taken away or hidden somewhere. So therefore the task of the inspection agency here, the IAEA, is to provide assurances that it has carried out all the necessary inspections and it has to went to uh, everywhere, it has gone to everywhere, it has talked to everybody and then according to this uh, inspections uh, uh, was fully convinced that there, there is nothing wrong. And the IEA says, I am not in a position to, to say anything like that at the moment. So, but this, this puzzle still continues and will also continue this. Uh, well, on Friday we have this midterm exam, which will start at 9 sharp. Don't be late. Take all the necessary measures, precautions to be here, because the exam will start at 9. Uh, and latecomers may not be admitted. Well, maybe five minutes, ten minutes would be okay, but if you come later, you may not be admitted. So uh, t uh, t consider the traffic if you come from the city or, um, I don't know, try not to be ill. Stay healthy. Uh, this is well for everyone for all times. And we'll start at nine and uh, here in this room. So uh, we'll see after, we'll continue the subject after the Bayram because there are too many other things to be 
discuss here. Okay, thank you for coming and see you on Friday.